the organizer of the festival director very much. So Miroy has something for us to say from uh, a minister. Are they going to play something? So he let him introduce what they're going to do before I call upon Shona. Um, yeah. Oh, so you're yeah. stamping me. If I may take a few microphone. minutes. <laughs> Are you going to be ready? In a few minutes, uh, my apologies. I did intend, first and foremost, to have parallel sessions all throughout the festival. So how we've ended having one program there and over here is a fulfillment of my original design. <laughs> That's the best way of looking at basically a screw up. <laughs> I got my part. <laughs> So please, I beg your indulgence. And uh, I want to introduce to you a very special friend. Please come here. We have uh, the Massive Foundation. Uh, has a lot of, and I think David, you would appreciate this. We are a lot, a lot of chiefs and no Indians, which is an expression we use, saying that there are lots of people, very important people, <laughs> and very few people to make it happen. So we are all chiefs and no Indians, which is of course ironic considering that we are in India. <laughs> um, and so Satyajit Ariba is uh, an advisory council member and uh, we reconstituted the Massey Foundation last year to create this advisory council and brought in four young people. Uh, the foundation trustees originally were my mother's friends and some of them have passed on. Many are, unfortunately, are weak and old. They're in the late 80s now, perhaps 90. And we have, I'm proud to say, the creme de la creme of Manipur's cultural leadership. We have three Padmashris among us. Three Padmashris return among us. And a lot of distinguished awards. Um, they have been the guiding spirit, and they are great artists. The greatest artists of Manipur today are on the trustees of the Master Foundation. But we want to reconstitute the Master Foundation as a forward thinking uh, organization because what we need is to create the legacy of MP and legacy necessarily by definition means for the future, for future generations, for the young people. So we have a new generation of very dynamic, enterprising young people from Manipur who are now on the advisory council and said to be the one of them. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Uh, well, it's all uh, uh, kindness. I'm just, a, I'm just a, a, like, you know, I'm just following him. Whatever he says, I'm, I'm trying to do my bit. And I'm very happy to associate with this Imasi Foundation. And I hope I can deliver my best, you know, level. I'll just say these few words and, you know, just continue because we're already late with the schedules. So, and uh, we'll be playing a short video from Honorable Minister Minashi Lekizi. She has just sent a video. And I'd like to play it. Thank you. And one of the things that... Uh, we have people now in Delhi helping us. Again, very, very unhappy that our dear friend Sanjeev Bihari is now in the ICU after his cardiac arrest, just the day before he's supposed to arrive here. And so we miss him terribly. We hope him, he will recover. Um, and as a new concept of a festival that is neither here nor there, or if you want to look at the other way, everywhere, um, we have been talking to a lot of uh, institutions and the idea of the festival keeps morphing as the discussions happen. Uh, in fact, sitting right in front of me is Shobna Chalaya, with whom I shared some of the earliest ideas of how this festival is supposed to, uh, could be. And we do have some of her original language in our proposal still. And um, so I thank her for helping conceptualize the festival, and as we talk to Tani Chante, dear friend, 
to Uma, to Hezekiel, through the uh, uh, pre-festival curtain raiser, it changed. Are we creating digital resources in the middle of all this by doing this? Perhaps we are. I mean, I, I came in the tail end of the discussion, and you're talking about television. Um, last night at 9 o'clock, we broadcast Asangba Nongjabi, Crimson Rain Clouds, a play on village community radio station called Diamond. It's about in one hour from south of Impal. And uh, I'm told that their, readership, their listenership is actually greater than All India Radio now. It's a community radio station run by some very enterprising young people in, a, in the farming community uh, near Thobao. Kongjom is actually the town they are based in, where the Battle of Kongjom took place. You know. So um, I'm very interested in rural community radio, uh, 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 radio stations. I'm very interested in radio, but I'm also very interested in the rural. I'm very sorry that we cannot take you to the Lothak polo game as planned, because the government announced that as of today, uh, no outdoor events can take place in Manipur because the children go into their school finals for the next couple of weeks. So all outdoor uh, events have been banned. Indoor, we can chat and talk and discuss. So, um, but we, we have to deal with uh, certain ways in which the Northeast works, which is frustrating, but it's also an interesting challenge. And, um, and, but being part of the process of creating culture over here, I think has been quite uh, the most rewarding thing about trying to put this festival together. It's been four years since we first started, and we do intend to travel this to other states in the Northeast. But right now we have the Pandwani. We're taping it all to send to UNT and uh, Indiana University. So you will get to see it, but we have Pandwani performers from Chhattisgarh playing, uh, performing right now, even as we speak over here. And this is our connection to say that through literature, through orality, through performance, we also connect to the mainland India, different cultures of mainland India. So every year we will have some program that will connect the Northeast to the rest of the country using literature, because we are not politicians, we're not funders, we're not economists, uh, we are arts, curators, performers, and activists. So um, while we were uh, setting all this up, are you ready? Not yet. Not yet? Um, we have a message coming in from Minakshi Lekhi, the Minister of Culture in Delhi, Minister of State, and we had met with her and she also was very interested, genuinely interested in this, not just being a minister, you know. We had a wonderful meeting, which probably went on for more than an hour, just us in her office. And uh, she has said that she will support this festival. And she supports it this year. It will happen next year also, I assure you. So I think we are on a good footing as far as the powers that be in Delhi are concerned. Um, Sentila Younger, and I've, we've been talking about, I might just say it because we're all family here, about doing the next one in Nagaland. We want to do Nagaland next year. Uh, the time we'll have to discuss a little bit, what is, what is when. And, uh, and so I wanted Satyajit to come and play the videotape that we just received, not half an hour ago, from Minakshi Lekhi's office. Uh, to the, to the listener, the attendants, the, the people who are participating, the organizers, and so on. So are you ready? It's a video, so we're going to project it here. Namaskar. It is heartening to know that IMASI, the Maharaj Kumari Binodini Devi Foundation of Manipur, is organizing the Listener Festival of Oral Literature, the unique initiative that focuses on preserving the non-text and pre-text traditions and literature of Northeast will bring to light the intangible cultural heritage of the region. Culture plays an important role in the development of any nation. It represents a set of shared values, attitudes, goals and practices. 
A country as diverse as India is symbolized by the plurality of its culture, the plurality and multiplicity of the Indian culture is evident to the whole world as India has one of the world's largest collections of songs, music, dance, theatre, folk traditions, performing arts, rites and rituals, languages, dialects, paintings and writings that are collectively known as the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Intangible cultural heritage of any nation is tantamount to the soul of its civilization, people and history. It is imperative that we preserve our intangible heritage for the coming generations. I am confident that the initiative undertaken by the Imasi Foundation will further help in promoting and preserving our heritage. My best wishes are to the members of the Imasi Foundation and all the participants for a successful oral literature festival. Jai Hind. Alright, so thank you, Somi and Satyajit, for this beautiful message from Minister Minakshi Lekhi. We are honored actually she, her message was played as part of our panel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's something nice. Anyway, thank you. So we are going to continue on creating digital resources for the indigenous languages. Now I call upon Shobna Chalaya to present her views on today's panel. Sure, I think, uh, shall I close this, uh, Hezekiel? Yeah, this is okay, then please. Yeah. You can place it on the back yeah, we can just. Yeah, we can just. Can I? Yes. Yeah. 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 Are like our goals at Corso for helping build digital resources. They're very different from linguist goals, I think, the way that we work as linguists. So as linguists, we often like pick one language and then we work through to try to get from the source material all the way to the description. But what we're trying to do in Corsal is work with community members to have them collect what they want, not what we want for making a grammar or a dictionary, but what they want for cultural preservation. So they, we train them to do that, and once they've collected that source material, we work with them to do the transcription. Some of you, only one person, two of you, who are not linguists here, I think everybody, and Ezekiel, so three, and our two tech people. So I'm speaking to you. <laughs> so you may not know how complicated it is to actually create digital resources for a language. That's what I wanted to, that's the, what I wanted to really bring across. So it takes many different steps, right? One is figure out what you want to record. Why is this piece important? Figure out how to do the recording right. Like these guys are trained. You know how to do video and you, all of us don't know. We have to learn. Like David now has it down. You've got nice framing for him. We've just learned how to pick the right equipment for the right place. We, we're learning those things, but we want to train community members once they choose what they want to record to do that. After they've done that, then there's just a recording. That's not a digital resource. That's like just some raw material. You can't do much with it except view it as it is. So we want to train them to use software to transcribe using some kind of practical orthography. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it does have to be authentic to the recording. So this is different from CIIL, where CIIL very often does wordless and does, you may also be doing the naturalistic text, but you also have a focus on linguists down, right? Because we say we want these wordless and we want, um, and I'm not. You go beyond that. You do, you do. It's the, it's the order probably. So I also do exactly what you do as a linguist, but for Corsal, what we're trying to do is to really build capacity, build the corpora up quickly by starting with this find the choice community members who are already ready to do this work, who maybe they're already doing it, and give them that added push of, here's a recorder, here's how you should use it, I'll be back with you in three weeks to see how you've done. 
and we have constant touch points with my, I'm calling them my staff, but they're really my students who love doing this work and they're on, they're on payroll, but as, as students. And my dream is to actually have staff, full-time staff, who can help with this contact with community members in different, different places. As I've traveled through India, especially Northeast India, I've met several community members who are really ready to do this work. They just need the finances and they need the support. So that's what I'm trying to do. So they, the second step is to train them, either that person or another group of people in the community, because it's not, often not the same person. One person is really good at finding the elders and recording, and then they're done with it, they're bored. Like they do not want to sit at a computer. They want to be out in the field. So you find another set of people who are like, give me a computer and anytime I have free time, I'll sit down and do the transcription. And they like technology. So they can create these kind of very simple transcriptions. And that's as far as we need to go, I feel, to get the first pass of work and really build up a corpus of Boro, a corpus of Tiwa, a corpus, many of these languages that we're talking about to then train linguists on my side of the, of, of the ocean and linguists here to be working together to get it to the, to the third step. So that's sort of my vision of where Corsal is going for long-term planning, for building up the corpora that we'd like for our computational resource for South Asian languages. So building a digital resource, like a, a digital dictionary, phone apps, like you said Motorola was doing, all of those things need those things that we began with, which is that recording of the community member recording a recipe or a doing, you know, how you build, how you do weaving, all, all that, all that feeds into the dictionary that we finally create. And so after they've done the transcription is the next phase. And we've been doing some training for people to start analyzing those longer pieces of text into words. Those words then go into a dictionary and they can then be added to with existing um, materials. Like we're also trying to, we're doing a lot of OCR uh, scanning. Like we've broken a lot of books in the last six months or so as I've moved from one state to the other. Rather than moving books, we've opened them up, scanned them, made sure we can OCR those and bring them into dictionaries, existing dictionaries or creating. And we've been work, work, working with people to build large spreadsheets with these word lists so they can then fill in cultural information. They don't have to be experts, but they can fill them in. So we just are working, us and Corsal are working with different sets of people in the community with different interests and different levels of expertise. So you don't have to have technological savvy all through the community. You just need people who can do different sorts of things. With the dictionary spreadsheet, what we found is one set of people go out and get the words. They type them in. Another set of people are really good at IPA and they work with either the recording or with the original person to get the IPA in. And that's actually something we've left for the last. The thing that we're really focusing on, getting good definitions and getting uh, older people to say exactly what kind of basket, what is it made of, how do you actually make this recipe, what is this kind of fish, where do you find it? So really detailed definitions that you don't find when Outsiders make dictionaries, they make very short definitions, like a basket, you know, a, t a type of black bird. So we're trying to avoid that kind of thing. And that's what we're focusing on with the dictionaries. Once those databases are made, you don't need Motorola. You really don't need them anymore. You want to you wanna do a phone app, you can go up to, you know, SIL is one of those places. You can go and do a phone app in like two seconds. Upload your database to Flex. Flex goes into their, their online, uh, you know, the way they do their online dictionaries, and from there you can do a phone app. But there are other phone app things you can get from, so many students are building phone apps nowadays, all you need is that big spreadsheet with the data. So we're help working with people to do that. So Motorola doesn't want to work with our languages of 1,000 people or 10,000 people, we don't care. <laughs> Goodbye, Motorola. We don't need you anymore. Or don't record that. But so then, uh, the, then the last part is that these long extended pieces, you know, people go in and put in the word meanings, but then they also have to figure out how the sentences are constructed. Where's the subject? Where's the verb? And so on. We need that for doing like faster translation, like automatic translation. And so to make bigger corpora. And so we, that, that's like the last part of the training. And my, my hope is that I will find more students. I had some great students at UNT who are working with 
uh, the populations that we're working with till the dictionary part. And I'm hoping now that we'll find more students to work on the, the, the higher translation part. So I'll summarize here. To build digital resources, you can use all sorts of fancy things. You can say, hey, you know, automatic speech recognition or this and that. But really what you need is linguists working with communities to collect really good materials, do phonetic transcription or orthographic transcription. No one else can do that but linguists because we're the ones who really can partner with people to help with phonemic right, analysis and really understanding how to do that. Next, doing definitions and word, you know, word level analysis and finally sentence level analysis. May sound boring, but we are really good at it. Linguists are good at it, and I hope that the next pot of money that comes out, somebody will hear that and say linguists are good at it and put some money behind that because if we can train community members to help with each step and then partner with linguists for the final step of analysis, then going from source to analysis will not be as daunting. It's not one person working individually on different languages, but a group of people working on a language or a language family. And I think we can, we won't do a perfect job, but we'll do a much faster job that can be then perfected by, you know, the David Petersons and the Tange Chantes of the world and linguists like yourself. You can go and take what's out there and in Corsal, half digested, ready for you to work on and give it to one of your students to then take to the next level. And I think we can do a lot more that way and communities will be invested in it as well. So that's Corsal's contribution to creating or Corsal's vision for creating digital resources for, for the world. Thank you so much. Uh, there may be a question. Yeah, I don't think so. Thank you for sharing your views on the vision of Corsal, which of course you are taking from UNT to Indiana. And uh, no, uh, Corsal remains at UNT because the infrastructure is so there. And Indiana and uh, Indiana and UNT will have an MOU. Wow. So I continue to direct it and so our students continue. We actually are growing rather than and moving, yeah. Yeah, that's okay, thank you. So it's interesting to do that. And now, having heard from Shobhana since morning, for about digital archiving, and she has been lecturing in many parts of India about yeah. this, so some of you are already familiar with this. Any questions or feedback or anything crucial that you think should be taken up or what did, No, you think it'll work? Think it's a good plan or is it, not, is it gonna not? It's worth a try, I mean, okay. No, <laughs> I think that's that's a good good way to think of it, like do it. Excuse See, me? It's already producing useful resources. Useful resources. Yeah, it's already producing some, like, for example, you found your story. I used it for my talk. You, you did, yeah, yeah. Yeah, people yeah. are, are I citing. I need to open this up and make sure you that, that it's in Corsal. Yeah. yeah. I think on uh, Google Translate and SubSkey, they have added a whole bunch of languages in the last few years. And it's off. Awesome. There was uh, Muzo and that uh, very few people, yeah. they found it very useful to be using Google Translate. Mm. See, I, I tried the Manipuri. Yeah. And have you, anybody tried the Manipuri Google Translate? Mm. Have you tried the Maitheron one? Yeah, some people have tried. Yeah, you can try it, but sometimes uh, there are lots of mistakes. That's what I thought too. I even even me knowing very little, it, maybe the miso is better because maybe they're. Uh, well, I, don't. I, I try it for Thai. Yeah, but, but the more you try it, the more it learns. It learns. It yeah, so it learns more. Yeah. yeah. Is this a software based out of Kerala or the south of India to translate this? Not part of what Google does. Where's the Google Google India? You There's mean? Google Translate, you know. Yeah. I mean, apart from Google Translate, is there some other company which is doing this in India? I mean, in South. Uh, I is Microsoft? So. Google yeah, India is very popular. Google is being being translated for, uh, from Microsoft. Yeah. Even for Assamese language, being translated from Microsoft is better than Google Translator, mm -hmm. and it uh, came much you know much more before uh, Google Translate. Yeah. I have heard some, some software, which is basically not in India. Yeah. 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 So many small companies are also doing, and see, Motorola, because we again and again talk about Motorola, yeah. like, um, see, their goal is, of course, uh, I was told that they have a kind of a template uh, word list or whatever. They give it to linguists, 
and and the linguist job is to find the right kind of native speakers and kind of elicit data and put the essential ipa and other uh, information and give it back there, there's a lot of uh, training for the linguist as well to use uh, different devices and how to fine tune his or her thinking to get it done as a mobile app and afterwards they are given maybe 3 months or maximum 6 months or so and they have to produce the product the problem is like though we are saying we don't need any such companies what is happening is many places in india we are all working in isolation and there is no one person or a body or an organization which can take up all of our uh, products i'm talking about indian situation uh, it's very nice corsal has an open repository system and is welcoming everybody to join hands and do it and uh, but many of them do not know about corsal except academicians so my request to you would be to give more publicity to it and what actually you do and many of them are scared when we say we want to transcribe we want to do other things because they are non linguists so that is so the what is the benefit of putting their indigenous valuable knowledge in corsal that's something we can uh, maybe you need to do some more mobilization so that people come forward to do that and uh, what so that we also can share and maybe we also need other repositories which can also afterwards join with corsal so something like, like that you know, see ils has started of course we are at a small level but yeah. we need more raw uh, yeah. to do yeah. uh, but in terms of the use you know we've just mentioned google translate so if we have resources that are built up those could then really help something a company like that yeah. uh, create that translation see, many mission. iits of india are interested in doing but they don't seem to know what to do because many of them talk to us when we are invited for talks they say we would like to work with linguists so i think now we must have some I, I, i don't know about iits and i don't want to say anything bad about anybody else but i want to say this is really hard work and it's very time consuming work yes, and know. people don't want to put the time in exactly. they want to hire somebody to do some word list and do that <laughs> it's not going to work yeah that is what yeah. is happening with many of the dictionaries yeah. what we see also most of the times they are not dictionaries they are just compilation of word lists somebody would have collected 2000 words or 3000 words they will put them together and produce something call it as a dictionary yes, yes. that is again a problem is yes, google translate working for other languages is there any example you mean for indigenous languages but chinese and i think mandarin and english people use it often for They're not even portuguese yeah. or japanese and english so you're Russian? saying the thai doesn't work okay. so russian works pretty well they say because uh, we get many uh, like i think you know evgeny kusmin he writes lengthy messages in russian and sends one line at the end saying oh mark use google translate <laughs> <laughs> no what i say so it works pretty well for brazilian portuguese russian yeah, yeah, french in, in ott platform also when you watch a movie there's a language option also yeah, yeah. yes also, the automatic so. captions right so it come out yeah, yeah. Full text. But you need our, just more you need more data basically yeah. but it's not and that's what we're trying yeah. you need well transcribed yeah, exactly. well translated data and that's what we're trying to do here so And why is some of the uh, like we just mentioned like in the in the case of Mizo, when it is when the uh, AI it is the artificial intelligence this question, the, it becomes more effective. I mean, uh, what 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 make it what differs? What is it that is behind the success of a Google translation for one particular? Yeah, it's the volume of it. It is, and so it's, imagine this, right? So if you have a word like, uh, so Meteron has a word like me, and if you pronounce it one way, it means spider. If you pronounce it another way, it means man. But to have that identical MI, if that's all the machine is seeing, it can't make the difference. So you have to have a way for the machine to distinguish polysemy, one word that means several things, or tone differences. So as it is only as good as the data that goes in and then the machine has to work really hard to <laughs> to understand those differences if you haven't pointed it out yeah So then it'll be instead it'll be talking about spiders instead of men I don't know.
Any other question for Shobana? Thank you for the panel. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Always nice to hear you. <laughs> yeah, now I invite upon Alindra Brahma to talk on what to be documented on digitized. So, first of all, I welcome you all to the session, and I welcome the organizers, uh, particularly Miss Mr. Somiro and uh, sponsors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, actually, yesterday, immediately, I thought that uh, I should, you know, speak on this, but. Uh, it's uh, not, you know, a kind of well-organized speech or well-organized slides here. But uh, as a linguist, and I belong to a community of Northeast India, uh, I have uh, some observations. Like uh, I left my native uh, village in 1997, 25 years back. Uh, at that time, we, you know, used to play around, like uh, four games and. Uh, like uh, we enjoyed, you know, but if I go back there now, it's like a feeling uh, like uh, I feel like uh, some something is not transmitting actually from the elderly uh, generation, not not elderly, elderly only, even from our generation to the present generation, the younger generation. So I thought that I should pick up some things which are, you know, missing there. Yeah, and uh, those actually, uh, you know, need to be digitized. Uh, I mean, documented and digitized. So uh, it's uh, like, you know, uh, uh, for, at the beginning, it's more like, you know, linguistic, but uh, towards the end, it's more like uh, folkloristic. <laughs> so actually, before I uh, joined CIIL, uh, I was looking for job, actually. So uh, even in 2011 and 12, I worked with NFSC also, National Folklore Support Center. So I was also into folklore, and it's uh, like uh, one of my favorite area. So I also worked actually a few things. So I start with uh, script, orthography, reading, and writing. So this is a kind of you know sharing my not only my. Uh, me and my team actually. So we were looking for a lost script, but it is not lost now. It's an endangered script uh, used by Boro people of Assam. So earlier actually we got to know that the name of this script is Zankrau script. Okay. But uh, uh, we, we found it as Mahiri Bidab. Okay. So we started from the westernmost part of uh, Assam. Then coming from there uh, towards the eastern part of Assam, we found it in Bizni area of the state. It is, uh, you know, under this Chirang district. Earlier it was Bongaigao district. So the left top uh, picture is of uh, vowel. So this is uh, like Brahmi script, O, A, E, E. But how they actually read it? It's, uh, you know, uh, like a O. It's like... Dui, uh, oh, actually, dui means water in Boro, and it starts with you know uh, school stage, the small kids. Mm -hmm. So how to read is actually o oh means what in baby talk, it is dui. Okay, dui means water in baby talk. It is o. Oh. If it is a baby then we will just, uh, you know, tell O. Oh. Okay, it's not they. But in general, uh, the term for water is they. In case of baby talk, it is O. Oh. So they will, uh, uh, not O, oh, sorry, go. Yeah, it's like go, O, oh, like that. Then A, ah, A ah, in baby talk, it means die. <laughs> so 
<laughs> so it's like uh, a thui, like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's connecting the baby talk also with the, you know, uh, the words in the normal uh, language. Then like uh, e, the, like a uh, small e, it's like a short e. So it's uh, e sung. Sung means short. E sung. E lao. Like that. Lao means long. Like that, they pronounce these uh, uh, letters. Then the right side is uh, the consonant set. Uh, there also, you know, uh, a systematic way of, you know, reading these consonant letters. Then I, uh, we also collected uh, some actually written text, handwritten text using this script. And actually they are using it, uh, you know, uh, in writing their uh, mantras, chant, chantings and, you know, the prayers. So in this uh, uh, handwritten piece of paper in the photograph, it is like Bhima Gederni Aros. Bhima means murder, Geder means big, Aros means prayer. Prayer of the big murders, like that. So now I'm learning it to, you know, how to read it. So I'm happy to share it with you. Yeah. So this is one handwritten uh, volume of using that uh, uh, script, actually. So the name of the book is Gudi Bizab. <clears throat> so it means primary book. So I, I uh, try to write this book, and now I can read the book, and I can understand also what is written in the book. So uh, our actually aim is to you know, produce one uh, script book, book of this uh, endangered script. So <clears throat> we have also you know, produced script books from uh, CIIL. So some of the pages we can show, this is from an introduction to Mite Mike. So we are producing, uh, it is in print already. So it is an introduction to Mite Mike, reading and writing. So I have my you know, uh, co-editor, uh, uh, Dr. Brozen Singh. So we uh, prepared it from CIIL. Uh, with the guidance of uh, Professor Uma Madam and all the senior people there. So we are, uh, you are putting the words, uh, letters like this, like this is pa. So uh, the general description, like fifth letter of the meeting mic, which is called EPIAC. There are 27 uh, letters in EPIAC of uh, meeting mic, then uh, eight letters in uh, Lonsu mic. So, we have already prepared this also. So we are trying to prepare a book like this for that script. So this is another letter from Mite Mike. So this is from Assamese. This is from Boro, like that, yeah. So these are the script books we have, you know, uh, prepared until date. So there are also, you know, some auto-instructional indigenous language learning courses we uh, tried to prepare actually. Already we, uh, you know, uh, prepared and published uh, from CNELT uh, on uh, Tiwa language teaching and learning. So this is uh, a kind of handbook where we actually incorporate uh, a basic, even uh, some advanced uh, level vocabulary uh, along with uh, the basic features of the language in, uh, you know, uh, graded manner in, uh, conversational text, uh, followed by some, you know, uh, 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 practices like that. <clears throat> so uh, I, I have also, you, show, uh, you know, in, in included this point that uh, we need dictionaries. So I got an idea actually from a computer scientist that if we can, you know, uh, uh, produce an online dictionary, suppose with 500 words, okay, then we have to give access to the users. I mean, uh, there should be like a, a provision of user interface. Some users, uh, even all the users can, you know, create their passwords and uh, IDs 
and they can uh, contribute to the dictionary. <clears throat> but it will not get you know, published immediately. There will be some people in the middle who will be monitoring and approving the you know, entries. If the entry is acceptable, it can go online like that. And it can be edited later on also. And uh, some uh, in important uh, informations uh, you know, related to that entry can be uh, you know, included later on. Then visual dictionaries, I uh, you know, got to see one like English, German, visual dictionary. Those kind of dictionary even, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it doesn't need, uh, doesn't need, does not need any, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> meaning also. You can, uh, you know, uh, give the meaning with the photograph. Uh, and another dictionary, good dictionary, interactive talking dictionary. This is uh, the whole idea of, you know, uh, creating interactive dic uh, talking dictionary is uh, uh, of uh, Professor Uma uh, in the CNELD. But, you know, we are just, uh, you know, started actually we have just started yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, now uh, coming to uh, folk speech so this is one of my uh, publications uh, I thought that actually uh, the folk speeches which are going to you know um, disappear those should be written down and uh, digitized like that so I uh, along with my wife, we collected uh, like uh, uh, around uh, 180 proverbs, 97 riddles, 222 idioms, 185 folk beliefs, myths, etc. of the Boro folk. And uh, actually, this is in Boro language. Uh, I I have a plan that uh, actually we should uh, uh, you know uh, translate it into English or other languages also. Yeah, yeah. So here, uh, I was very much interested in, you know, how to, you know, uh, describe the folk belief. Okay, like uh, in folk beliefs, what is happening? Uh, like uh, I have already uh, included somewhere in uh, in the slides, but I will uh, tell you. Suppose the dragonflies are, uh, you know, flying low, not uh, uh, you know above, uh, uh, not too above low then it's a kind of, you know, a belief that it's going to be rain. It's going to rain, it's going to be raining. And uh, it can be also, you know, uh, like uh, traditional, uh, uh, what we can, weather forecast system kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Then I actually uh, worked with one of my friends. He is now uh, director of uh, physical education at Dibrugar University, Dr. Montu Boro. One day he called me that, uh, do you know any name of our local folk games? So I said that I have a list. Already I had this list before he called me. So, uh, I already collected uh, 26 general folk games, which you know maybe they played by uh, any uh, age group of people, and like uh, 12 uh, <coughs> folk games, which are basically used by uh, kids, the younger uh, people. So uh, he also asked me, "Do you know this game? Uh, how to play these games?" Then I said that I can remember that. Uh, if uh, I can get a chance, I can uh, try to recreate. Because these are no more played in the, you know, in our village or the, you know, the, uh, uh, the localities actually. So he asked me, can you draw one playground of one, you know? <laughs> so I did this one. So this is called Ridi. Some people also call, uh, you know, uh, different, uh, they use different name to, you know, this uh, particular game. So, uh, as you can see, it's a very systematic game. You know, so it, it looks, you know, uh, like uh, it's uh, like uh, Kabaddi or, you know, more systematic than Kabaddi, mm -hmm. like that, no? Yeah. <clears throat> so I uh, explained this to him, 
uh, I think today I <laughs> should not explain because it takes long time to explain it actually. Yeah, anyway, that B1, B2, B3, B5, B, uh, B4, B5, these are like, you know, uh, one uh, line uh, that uh, people players in that uh, blue hat, they will be there, you know. And entry one, two people that with the red hat, uh, at least two people should enter through entry one like that. And the first B1, he will be, you know, leaving, uh, you know, letting them go. Just he will be in the middle at the time of entry, like that. Then they have to go, you know, uh, and finish all the Bs. Yeah, yeah. Then the same kind of entry will be, you know, through the re-entry at the side, like that. And there are some rules like uh, while touching the, you know, player, and then uh, they should not, you know, uh, touch the line like that. Or if someone goes out of the line, out of the field, he will die like that. I mean, out of the field. He cannot uh, continue the play like that. So this is, a, a, you know, I got it a very, uh, you know, systematic, and I, I can recreate it now even. <laughs> if someone asks, uh, you know, how, how to play it, then uh, most of the games I know how to play. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> then uh, coming into the traditional knowledge systems, actually, uh, I uh, went through so many things, actually, which are related to traditional knowledge systems, like uh, traditional performances, magical realism is also related to date, which has its place in science fiction also. It's a kind of, you know, uh, I, I think uh, the, the, the recent uh, literary theory also this one, magical realism. So these kind of things are there actually, which we need to, you know, digitize. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I have included uh, like a charm also, which is uh, used in, you know, in influencing someone. I, 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 I yeah, I, I know myself. How, how does it work actually? Uh -huh. You know? <laughs> It's like if uh, uh, one girl doesn't love me, I can just apply it, she will love me. Yeah. <laughs> this kind of thing, practice is there. Yeah. And then folk medicine. Uh, and uh, along with folk medicine, we can have, you know, this kind of uh, terms, ethnobotanical linguistic terms. And how these terms are formed, actually. So we can find in the names of uh, plants, med medicinal plants, their names are, you know, uh, if you can see, it's kind of uh, uh, extended metaphor. They find out similarities, uh, you know, with some other thing and give the name to it like that. So I worked on uh, word formation and Tiwa, uh, Dimasa and Boro, and I got some, you know, uh, this kind of data actually. So, and these are related to uh, folk medicinal plants actually. Uh, then hunting tradition, uh, I worked on uh, hunting tradition also. I have some photographs also, I'll show you. So uh, these are the things that I think that uh, we should work on. Uh, not only on Boro actually, this is for other uh, tribal languages or indigenous languages also, because I have gone to different uh, linguistic areas like Tiwa, uh, Dewri, Dimasa. So um, it's important, I think. So this is uh, some photographs uh, of hunting tradition we uh, did in nine, 2017 and 18, uh, just before pandemic. So it's actually nowadays it is an endangered tradition. Hunting is an endangered tradition, but it should be uh, endangered. We should not encourage hunting anymore. But there are so many things related to you know uh, community and their language in this hunting tradition. <clears throat> and uh, even the, uh, you know, the trap, an agate trap. I requested this person that if you can, you know, make it for us. We are not going to use it, but you just, you know, make it. He, he, he made it for us, actually. And he showed how to, you know, uh, trap the, 
uh, trap and I get like that. Yeah, yeah. But this uh, collecting firewood, this is real. Uh, it is happening now also. It is not an not hunting actually, not an example of hunting. What happens? Uh, the uh, village people who are residing near uh, the you know forest area, when they have to you know uh, do some festival or ritual, and uh, you know they have to prepare food for so many people. They need uh, you know firewood. Then they will you know take permission from the forest you know inchers and uh, they will allow, allow them to bring, uh, you know, uh, dry, dry firewoods, actually. They cannot cut, you know, <clears throat> but they can bring the dry ones. So these are also like, uh, uh, it, it, these are also part of, you know, uh, folk uh, hunting tradition. Like uh, these are, uh, uh, you know, wild vegetables, yeah. And uh, now the people, the new generation, they are not, you know, uh, knowing uh, names of these, <laughs> you know, plants also. So I included this, uh, yeah, like uh, this is hunting tradition, community fishing. So uh, there are so many, you know, terms and, uh, you know, stories, uh, encounters happening in this kind of, uh, you know, activities. So those may be uh, uh, digitized. And I have, uh, you know, taken some lost or endangered words. Actually, uh, due to, you know, uh, like uh, this uh, hunting tradition becoming endangered, this is also endangered. The word is also endangered because this particular sandals made of tire. It is used in hunting only so that you can run around inside, yeah, <laughs> inside the jungle. Anyway, this is Faita. We cannot get it, and uh, uh, the young generation, they do not know the name of this. Yeah. Again, this is uh, uh, a piece of wood used to strike on it while washing clothes in the river. Even I could not find any image of it now, <laughs> like that. It is called Nader. So uh, everywhere water is drying. We do not have you know, uh, water in river in our native places. So it may be, you know, uh, because of that also. Uh, this is also like uh, this baby loom, traditional baby loom. We cannot find it, yeah. <clears throat> then uh, as uh, Professor Savannah has already said about uh, this cuisine and recipes, even yesterday, uh, Mr. Somi said about it, we have to, you know, uh, uh, it's not uh, necessary that we have to, you know, revitalize the food items, but the, you know, uh, the story, the instructions, actually the cuisine and recipe, uh, how to prepare the food. Those stories we can, you know, <laughs> yeah, document and digitize. So uh, these are also uh, some aspects, seasonal, social, religious, agricultural rituals, which we can document and digitize. So uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to include one thing that uh, uh, we, we, we come across, you know, this kind of restrictions, restricted data, restricted researchers, that should not happen. Uh, a researcher, he or she, uh, himself or herself should not <laughs> be restricted. Uh, then restricted domains also. So uh, with this restricted data, actually I can give you one, uh, one, one, uh, 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 yeah, my, one of my experiences actually, when I, uh, I was assisting my uh, friend, actually he, he is uh, an electronic engineer and he was, you know, um, designing one uh, silkworm detecting system. Uh, silkworm detection system means when the silkworm uh, stops eating and starts you know, making its cocoon. Then we have to identify it and keep it aside. Okay, so he tried to, uh, you know, uh, uh, make one uh, such detective system. So I went with him in a Rajwanshi village in Swalkusi area of Assam. It is just uh, 20, 25 kilometer from Guwahati. So, uh, we came to know that there is a folk song, and it is, you know, 
restricted data. Only uh, adult female can sing it and no one can go there and listen to it. Because what they do, when the, uh, when the silk worm okay, uh, comes out of its cocoon in the form of a, a moth, then they will keep the <coughs> female moths only on a dried cotton, clean cloth to you know, lay eggs. And they will just uh, throw out the male ones. And to you know, make them lay eggs, they will welcome uh, male moths, butterflies, from across seven rivers. It's a, it's a belief. OK. So to welcome those male uh, ones, they will sing a song which we cannot, you know, yeah, <laughs> we cannot record. <laughs> because it may have some uh, slang words like that, which, you know, these uh, younger uh, female members or male members cannot, you know, hear like that. <laughs> so he said that, uh, can, can we hide one recorder inside the room where they sing? <laughs> but I said that it's not ethical. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, we cannot uh, get some data because of this kind of thing. And uh, restricted domains is like uh, this place. Actually, when we, yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, we, when, when we went to this place, they said that if you are not from our religion, you cannot take this data uh -huh. like that. So this kind of restriction is also there. So luckily, I am Brahma. They are also Brahma. OK. So I could go there and collect data. And uh, uh, this is kind of you know um, data, which actually we had to wait for long, actually. This is dancing on a short, actually, sub short. It's a completely kind of you know shaman dance kind of thing. So, we cannot get this kind of uh, data, actually. We, we had to wait for 10 years to you know, uh, collect this data. OK, so I just uh, you know, <laughs> finish you. here. <laughs> thank you so much. So thank you, Alindra, yeah. for sharing your experiences on documenting yeah. and digitizing Bodo. Yeah. Though it is one of the scheduled languages of India, yeah. you know very well it is. Still, there is much more to be done in Boro. So, any questions and feedback, comments? Those two books really helpful. Yeah. And I think the restricted stuff, we don't hear a lot about, so it's nice that you explained it. Yeah. So, do you feel like because you're Boro and you, you know, you're Brahma and you got those things that you can share? Like no, say, it was uh, like, you know, I do not think that uh, they do not allow actually. but. Uh, before we go there, some people went there. They told us that uh, we are not from this religion, so they, they uh, did not allow us. But they did not ask us anything, oh. yeah. even our names. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. But it may happen in some other places. Yeah. Any other question or comment? Nobody? Good. So <laughs> thank you, Alindra, <laughs> once again, because of course, a long journey to continue and document many more things, whatever you can, because you still have a lot of years in your service, both of the Institute, even otherwise. I'm sure you'll be able to do it. So now I would like to invite uh, Sony Roy at the end of the day and at the end of the session. He is going to talk about creation of digital resources at, uh, I don't think so, you can go. So he's going to talk about creation of digital resources, basically at the Massey Foundation, along with UNP, and his focus is going to be on open access. Thank you. So me, the floor is yours. The time is yours. The last few seconds. 15 minutes. Dadra, Kapagal. Screenshot or you are the copy to Raga? Okay.
Um, <clears throat> thank you, Umarani. Um, as also the director of this festival, I'm very grateful for the two panels that uh, CIIL has uh, organized, along with uh, two talks, one by Dr. David Peterson and the other by Gilvan Muller, uh, D'Oliveira, which will be on Thursday. Uh, online, incidentally, no, since... Tomorrow, you have to create the link, right? Yeah. No, day after tomorrow. Day after. Yeah. Oh, I'll check. Yeah, day after. So, um, the road has been a somewhat long and interesting one, interesting to me, certainly. And ever since um, I started visiting Manipur, um, I started taking up certain projects. And um, one of them was manuscripts of Manipur, and which I started first with the University of Kentucky after shopping it around at, to Columbia Un University and to Cornell. I figured that all change must come from the fringes. And so I went to Kentucky and worked on the Manipur, Manipuri Manuscripts Digitization Project. And um, that is when I met Shobna. We organized a Manipur colloquium in 2007 at UK in Lexington. It was a one-day program by Dr. Evelyn Knight. And uh, we brought Mangangsana, the Pena Balladier, whom you saw uh, in Delhi as well, Ezekiel. And he'll be featured on the last day. He's also an Imasi Foundation trustee. And um, from that, we tried to raise money for this, I think at least five different times. Twice with UK, Lexington, and Certainly, and that involved the British Library and the Dun Huang project that I brought here. And then three times, three times with NEH. you yeah. through uh, to NEH, two NEH and, and, UCLA. and one to UCLA. Interesting and oddly, we always got turned down. And Mary Molinaro, who was my uh, partner at UK, was herself serving on the committee for the NEH, the panel. She was on the panel. And uh, of course, we made sure there was no conflict of interest. But having been on the funding end of things, I've also been at, on certain panels for NEA and for NISCA and so on in New York. Um, we know that it was a very good proposal. Our proposal, Shobna, you also were there when you were with the science project with the NSF. You've been on both sides of the, of the grantor and grantee, and we know it's a really good uh, project. In fact, the VC asked me about it the other day, what happened to it? Um, you went off and created Corsal. I went off and started writing books, and I used my research in manuscripts to create a book. I wrote a book called And That Is Why, uh, first book on Manipuri mythology uh, from Penguin, and I'll be writing a sequel. I am writing a sequel right now. Are you guys ready? Okay. I'm talking just to wait for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, in the process of all this, I started creating certain digital resources. One is something called the Manipuri Learning Module, which while we were setting up how we're going to be working together, I parked it on Zenodo at the suggestion of Dr. Nathan Hill at, of SOAS, now with Trinity College in Dublin. And my mother's uh, literature is a whole trove of stuff, both published, unpublished, drafts, notes, etc., that I have to create as an Imasi Foundation archive. This is going to be the final step of my work with Imasi Foundation. The first one is making sure that they don't get lost and get published. I published four books last year. One, this book in, is now in Bangla, 
It came out last year. I wrote a biography for Sahitya Academy Award, uh, Academy, and I have to now republish all the books in Maite Mayik for all the people in Manipur University. So I'm working on some other titles now. We have, I've, I have two more books to publish from Binodini's work. I've published three unpublished books, manuscripts so far. I've actually published 11 books since I came back here, which is about five or six years ago. So this has been my main thing. But one of the things that we did was Crimson Rain Clouds, which is the translation of the play that was broadcast last night. Um, I did the translation to English. And because it's a short play, 50 pages long, I included the original in my Temeyik, which had never been done before, and the original in Bangla script in which my mother wrote it. And then I included the audio of the play recording, audio recording, and a transliteration. And, I, and for that, I produced a transliteration romanization system, and which I ran by you and by Nathan and several other people. I still haven't published it. I, I want to publish it all as a book. Photographs from the original stage version and accompanying introductory essays. So that anyone in the world can sit anywhere, Rio, Osaka, Johannesburg, anywhere, and learn Manipuri. Without, if you know how to read English, you can read, you can learn Manipuri. You will hear what it sounds like, you will be able to read what it looks like, you can understand it through the English translation, etc. It's a, it's a module. And so this is one of the things that we have, we are talking about how to uh, put it in Corsal, as we already have it in Corsal in a way. And so there'll be an Imasi Foundation collection at Corsal that we have been working on for the last few years, actually, four or five years now. Okay, next slide. In the course of this, when I came back here, I disappeared for more than 20 years. And I forgot who all my relatives are. And I have 13 grandmothers. And I have no idea how to, who's my aunt and who's my cousin and so on. So I started something called the Jalakili Project. It's a project based on the Sri Sri Govinda Jiu Jalakili Pala. Pala means choir. It's a music project of Nata Sangirtan, Manipuri classical music. And it is based in the palace at the temple. It's a family project because only descendants of Maharaja Narasimha are allowed to sing in the, in the choir. Whether you can hold a tune or not is secondary. And uh, for this, I created video documentation of the performers because I wanted to know who they were. I didn't, I didn't, they seemed to all know me, but I didn't know them. And so we did about 20 video interviews by Abo, our a uh, man who's the coordinator here. And so we've parked that. We gave all this to Mark Phillips of UNT, and it is all at UNT archives right now. And we did interviews, and we, we made a film about the performance itself. It takes place every May on uh, Buddha Purnima, the full moon of the Buddha in May at the palace. And then we put, translated the original text from 1844. That's when the Pala started. And then we published all of this, including profiles of past members, in a, in a book called Ningxing Lakpada Jalakeli, meaning remembering Jalakeli, and is by my cousin, Thoding Jam Lakshmi Priya. She is not a scholar and she is not a writer, which makes the book for me extremely attractive. It is just raw, hagiographic, memory based, based on interviews with other family members. There's no pretension, there's no analysis, there's no theoretical framework, nothing. It is just a list of things and, and profiles. We're trying to finish one before you leave, so I can give you a thumb drive you can take because it's very heavy, the file. If I have to send it, I'll have to. And in the process of this, I created a gene digital genealogy. And right now, any money for can actually go there and put their family tree in there but based on the women of the choir. So these are some of the digital resources that I'm, I have developed so far. And uh, 
we wish to take it to the next level. And I hope I'll find some time after today to sit down with you and kind of talk with you all about what you, what, what some of the things we can do. And, um, but the larger goal is to create a digital archive. Um, you didn't come yesterday, but you've been there, my house. I'm hoping to turn that into a digital library, mainly because I can't bear to live in Impal anymore, uh, the traffic and the dust. <laughs> so, um, so I want to turn that into a, I'm finish, finishing up the legal uh, paperwork for that, uh, turn that into a digital library and research center. So Pangi, if you, want, if you want to come and study something related to the Northeast through our collection, the, what the documentation we're making here this time would all go into that foundation so with the help of the metadata expertise of uh, Shobna and staff at Indiana and in UNT. And so uh, my ultimate goal is to create uh, an Imasi Foundation a digital archive for international and national the digital knows no boundaries, um, study and research. Universal access, international research, collaborative scholarship that we'll be talking about tomorrow. And so these are some of the things that I've already found a potential museum partner here in India, and because I need all the help I can get. And so that's what I've been working on. The two things, the Manipuri learning module, and then the Jalakili project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonny, for this, I should say, short but crisp wrapping up in oneself because we have been sitting here for two hours, believe it or not. We started at four. We thought we will end up within maybe 70 minutes, 90 minutes, but, but that shows that even though the members are less, but the interests were there and people were kept engaged. So I'm not going to <laughs> wrap up again because I think all of us are very much tired. I just would like to end by saying that it is important for us to contribute in all possible ways to create digital resources for languages of India in general and to be more specific for Northeast India. Just even though it's going to be little by little, we know that little drops of water make a mighty ocean. So that's a song, isn't it? That's a saying. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes, anyway, indeed. so thank yeah. you so much, so me for giving us a platform to talk about this because that's very very important. Yeah. And since it's recorded, I believe it will be kind of uh, shared with the community people so that they get their reaction and they arouse their interest so that they can join us in this project and maybe we, or the other way around, we can join them and help them to build their own digital you know, resources. So, so, sometimes people get, you plan something and other people get ahead of you because yeah. they, mm -hmm. they see things that you don't. Uh, I got a message the day before, after the op uh, when I was planning the opening, from a friend of mine who teaches at Ambedkar University in Delhi. She's saying, please share the YouTube videos ASAP, and she's going to be teaching her students at Ambedkar University using the documentation that we are producing. So people already are interested. Interested, yeah, that is great. Yeah, so thank you so much. Once again, so I thank all of you on behalf of CIL for being either a speaker or a listener in the Listener Festival. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank have you have a nice evening. Uh, and thank you guys for your patience because since morning you have been doing this job. <laughs> thank you.